Welcome back to the Shine Within podcast. I have here Dr. Dolores Fazzino, DNP, stands at the intersection of traditional medicine and spiritual wellness. A gifted medical intuitive and nurse practitioner, she's passionately dedicated over four decades to a pioneering approach that merges spirituality with health. From an early age, her intuitive talents, empathic nature, (laughs) and heightened sensitivity set her apart. Graduating from the renowned Case Western Reserve University with a Doctor of Nursing Practice degree, Dr. Fazina recognized the pressing gaps in conventional healthcare. Her unique approach extends beyond the conventional mind-body connection, enveloping spirituality as the key component of wellness. By blending traditional medicine with energy healing and intuitive counseling, she offers her clients transformative pathways to navigate life's challenges, rekindling a profound connection with her inner essence. An accomplished author and captivating speaker, Dr. Fazino shares her extensive insights on mind-body wellness and health care on global platforms. Thank you so much, Dr. Fazino, for joining me today. Well, Gina, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor to, to be with you and to and to share. Yes, I'm so excited that, you know, we've had a couple of instances where we're trying to get on the podcast show together and then there were some <laughs> hiccups. <laughs> But that's well, okay. you know what? we're here. It, Gina, it's all about timing. You you I think you realize that too. And sometimes it's just like, you know, it's not like no, it's like not now. Oh, and okay. I think that is, and I feel that is such an important thing to share with, you know, the audience because it's like just because we ask for something and it doesn't get delivered immediately doesn't mean that it's not coming. It's just, it's in its own time and space. And, you know, maybe other things need to get lined up behind the scenes that we aren't privy to in order for things to move forward. So here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Beautifully said too. <laughs> mm. So can you just tell us about your journey to becoming a nurse practitioner and then transitioning into the realm of energy healing? Oh my gosh. Well, you know, my story goes back to when I was a child, because as you know, we discussed before we got online here or on the record, um, you know, a lot of times you are where you need to be to gain the knowledge and the wisdom that you have in order for you to carry on and do what your life's work supposed to be. But for me, I'm just going to share the story. It's it's pretty much, I was born an empath, intuitive, and highly sensitive person. So I came in, I grew up in the, in the 60s. So this was an era of white picket fences. What, what are the neighbors going to think? And every, everything was supposed to look perfect on the outside, but it was a shit show on the inside, okay? For lack of a better description. So being an empath, intuitive, and highly sensitive person at birth, I was born into a family where um, my mom was a product of an alcoholic household. So for her, anything that had to do with feeling, she just didn't go there. Her MO was ignore it, it'll go away. Well, I would, you know, naively try to ignore it and go away and it kept growing bigger. So I would say to my mom, I said, it's not going away, it's getting bigger. So innately, I really got, so we weren't allowed to feel in our household, okay, or express feelings or emotions. That's just the way it was. And so I needed to get another venue for myself to channel that energy. And so the arts are so important, especially music. And for me, I took to that like a duck to water. I really excelled in um, music. In fact, I was a concert clarinetist and that was the pathway that I was heading towards as you know, entering um, my junior and senior year of, of high school to decide what I was going to do. Now, also in tandem with that little piece of information was that when I was in second grade, my dad ended up throwing out his back and needed to have back surgery, which he did have when I was in second grade. So I was probably about seven years old. And he picked up a hospital acquired infection back in the mid 1960s, which was considered a death sentence, people, Mm -hmm. because back then in the 60s, they didn't have the technology, the diagnostic 
ability with machinery and x-rays and MRIs and stuff like that. And also the, the medications like the antibiotics that would help people. So my dad, as a result of that, was in the hospital for over two months. He was on his deathbed. He received last rites in the Catholic faith that he was pretty much going to die. He did survive, but when he came home, he looked like a shell of the man that I remembered. He was probably down to 125 pounds and his guide was robust at 180. Um, that was like scary stuff for me because my mom would not let on that anything bad was happening, but intuitively I knew something was not right. So he survived that. And four years later in about 1970, when his immune system got compromised, this whole sequela would reoccur, meaning that he would be in the hospital, he would be sicker than you could imagine. He, we didn't know if he was going to survive or whatever. That happened in 1970, 1972, 1974, and then in 1975. So my childhood was an emotional roller coaster like this. We weren't allowed to feel, remember that? So I really excelled in my music. That's where I poured all my emotion. So what had happened the last time this episode happened, my mom was at her wit's end. In fact, she was looking for alternative possibilities to help my father heal from what he was experiencing. And so, and you have to understand this is mid 1970s. We didn't have computers. We didn't have Google search. We didn't have WebMD we had the National Enquirer, okay? <laughs> I and remember I that. About, yes, you do. And it was like, this is where a lot of lay people got their news and, and, and stuff and information. And so it just so happened that in the National Enquirer, this um, reverend from Carroll, Michigan, Reverend Alex Holmes, who was a Presbyterian minister with the gift of laying on of hands was being featured in an article because he had, he assisted his brother from healing from leukemia. Mm -hmm. It wasn't him, but through him, he assisted his brother to heal. And also Reverend Holmes in 1975 was doing this work for well over 25 years. So he had been doing it since the 1950s. So you also have to understand that this was on the cusp of woo woo. And yeah. it was just like considered like quackery or whatever. And so my mom was you know, grasping for straws because Western medicine had failed her tremendously. And at the same time in 1975, the first piece of um, diagnostic equipment came out called the CAT scanner, okay? Mm -hmm. And so they put my dad underneath the CAT scanner and they found that where his problem was stemming from was where he had his original surgery back in 1966. Mm. So anytime his immune system would get compromised, somehow this thing would raise its ugly head and just like, you know, go, go, go crazy and create a lot of physical problems for my father, which required hospitalization, being in the hospital for two months at a time and being on his deathbed. Mm. Um, so my mom was all over this possibility of having an alternative possibility. My dad, not so much. He was the biggest skeptic. He should have been from Missouri, the show me state. We joke about that because we grew up in Connecticut. But what had happened was he had said to my mom, only if the surgeon says it's okay. So it just so happened. My parents, my dad was in the hospital. My mom was there and my mom walked out to the nurse's station and his surgeon was sitting there and he, she went up to him and said, you know, doctor, I'm thinking about having the spiritual healer come in. Would that be okay? Surgeons writing notes, looks up at her, says, sure, that would be fine. And my mom took that as a blessing, went and shared that information with my father. My father agreed. So my mom was all excited in all of this. Not 10 minutes passed from when she first came out to the nurse's station. And when she returned, same doctor sitting there, she shared with the doctor, my husband agreed to have the spiritual healer come in. The doctor stopped what he was doing, looked up at her and said, what are you talking about? I never agreed to that. Mm. So this is where things were getting lined up behind the scenes to, so I could share with you what transpired. Of course, my mom didn't share that piece of information with uh, my father. 
And a month later, Reverend Holmes came from Carroll, Michigan to our home in Connecticut to administer his services and healing to my father. So what happened was this. Um, I remember coming home. I was a junior in, in high school and my siblings, I have a brother and two sisters and my two grandmothers were there and my parents and Reverend Holmes. Holmes. And so um, Reverend Holmes, he was just this very humble, beautiful soul. He had the most incredible energy and he just was very observant. And how observant was this, that he realized that my father had one leg that was shorter than the other. And I don't know how he knew this. We all knew this. My dad was barefoot, okay? No slippers, no shoes with a lift or anything in sight, but he knew this. So he had my father sit down in the chair and he asked him to please put both his feet up. And sure enough, there was a one inch gap between the longer and the shorter had him put his feet down and said some prayers over my father. He touched his belly, which is a solar plexus and the top of his head, his crown chakra. And I don't believe two or three minutes went by. And then he said, please put both your feet up. And they were both the same length. Oh, wow. My father, remember he needed, he was a skeptic. He needed to see some type of visual thing that something was actually occurring. Started crying like a baby, like I've never witnessed before. In that moment, I knew my life path changed forever. It was almost as if this was my initiation that I was to go into healthcare to bridge the gap between what is in the physical and the spiritual and the invisible and the visible. So the Reverend continued to work on my father for another half hour, and then he was instructed to go rest. And as we know, with any big major energy healing, there is a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes. There's a lot of integration, a lot of blockages are moved, things are rearranged. And the best way sometimes to um, integrate that is to sleep. So my dad was instructed to rest. My dad slept for over 24 hours that day. A month later, he returned to the CAT scanner to get a repeat um, scan because they were contemplating having my father go in for surgery to have what they call a spinal fusion, which in 1975 was in its neophyte stages of development. And it came with a lot of high risks of either you will die, you will be paralyzed, or maybe you won't get better, or maybe you will get better. So he did get another repeat CAT scan. They found no evidence of the infection. My father never had to revisit that problem ever in his life again. And my father passed away at the age of 80, about 11 years ago. Oh, wow. So for me, that was how I was introduced to what I do currently. Um, so with my sensitivities of being an empath intuitive and a highly sensitive person, I'm really a medical intuitive. And I read, I'm very proficient at reading energy, the energy of thoughts, beliefs, emotions, whether or, and whether or not they're blocked or not, but also the connectedness with a person and their higher self, okay? Meaning that that little voice, that intuitive ability that we all have, that somehow we've bypassed when we've come into this incarnation, or we've been told it is not how we do things here on earth, but it is, and we're heading into that direction. It's about teaching people to step into their power, take their power back, connect with that higher self, trust that wisdom that they're getting from inside, no matter what's going on around them, so they could have true health and lasting wellness. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that story. And that's an incredible story. That's beautiful. To see that just by the reverend, right? He just comes and just already yeah. knew, it, like, oh, by the way, when one leg is taller than the other. My son wore, wears a lift. And so we did the whole thing at the chiropractor's office where they had the legs up and everything. And just to, know, just to see them even all this yeah. after minutes later, that's like amazing. Yeah. Now, yeah. what you're sharing is that reminds me of my story where I was sharing with you earlier that, you know, with the alcohol, I really didn't understand who I was until I got sober minded. Once I became sober minded, I then started really digging deep. But who is Gina really? 
And then during the whole COVID, I started learning my gifts of like talents, those types of gifts. Mm -hmm. Later on, just recently, I learned about my psychic ability gifts. <laughs> I'm even able to go into my own Akashic record and start learning more about my true soul identity. And I mm -hmm. just was, I'm just like blown away of like, who I am. And I was actually a shaman back in the 1700s as a male in mm -hmm. Costa in Costa Rica. And that tribe still exists to this day. <laughs> I forget what it's called. <laughs> I had guidance with me, uh, helping me figure that out. Um, Cause, and then she told me how I need to go into my Kashic records and really learn who I am as a soul being. And it's just amazing. And You're so you're going to find some incredible things out that are going to blow your socks off, girlfriend. <laughs> my goodness. I know it's, it's absolutely nuts. I'm like, I didn't know I had all this. So anyway, my, my mom and her side of the family uh, on her mother's side of the family, most of my grandma's side and all of them had some type of abilities where they can actually see yeah. my mom. So it said like once we, I was telling my husband this the other day too, that she, when she was a little girl, she was going inside her house and then she saw a man, you know, look like an Abraham Lincoln with a tall hat, you know? Mm -hmm. And then she's like, Oh, hello. And walks by. And then but she turned around like, wait a minute, who is this person? Not there anymore. And so she yep. had the ability to see. Now I only have the ability to hear uh, I have the ability to feel and I have the ability apparently of knowing it. <laughs> Three mm -hmm. other mediums or uh, psychics and um, whatever you want to get, spiritual healers <laughs> uh, had actually told me this before. And I was just like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Now, do you believe that everybody has gifts or is it genetic or is it everybody has these psychic abilities? You know what? That's an interesting, that's an interesting question. And I'm going to give you my take on it. I believe that everybody has that capability. If you look at it on a continuum where it's like less developed and highly developed, everybody has that capability. Okay. Based on, you know, previous lifetimes, you talked about Akashic records. So, you know, about previous lifetimes and stuff like that. Maybe those gifts were really enhanced and really utilized you know, a lot during those other lifetimes. And maybe in this lifetime, when you came in, maybe they weren't going to be activated until you're later in life. It just, you know, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes before we actually incarnate in this lifetime, okay? A, a great resource to check out if people are curious about what happens before you incarnate there is an author by the name of Robert Schwartz who does between life regressions um, because I find that his information was a game changer for me when I read this over 20 years ago, because let me just share a little bit about that. You know, sometimes I used to wonder why is it some people who are born are born maimed or they're abandoned at birth or, you know, certain circumstances are kind of horrific, okay, in our description of it, but yet why is this, why does this happen? And I question my, you know, the whole thing, if God was such a, you know, powerful God, why would he allow this to happen? So this really helped that situation. What, he, what Robert would used to do is take case studies of people who've had different circumstances in their lives okay and then he would get two intuitive mediums who didn't know this person and these mediums didn't know each other and he he would they would go into the uh the person they would tap into the person's energy and go back to before they were born and do you know that the two um mediums would get very similar descriptions and situations of that particular problem mm -hmm. so in the nutshell, what usually happens is this. We sit with a council before we're born, you know, when we decide what our soul is going to need to grow at its most profound and deepest level. Okay. And we come to earth because number one, we have free will here. We get choice. We have a physical body. You need a physical body to experience emotions. Emotions are part of the secret sauce of developing yourself and your soul. Because when you're in spirit form, you don't get to experience emotions, okay? You need to have a physical body. 
So with those two things in mind, you know, you set up beforehand, you pick your parents out based on what, you know, situations and there's a whole group clan that happens and there's more stuff going on behind the scenes. Okay. And then finally everything kind of gets dialed in and tuned in. You're, you're almost getting ready to be born. You're given a dose of am, an, you know, am, am, you know, amnesia. So you're not going to remember any of this and then you're born and then you are because of free will figuring it out as you go. Okay. The different choices. And, you know, it's not like one choice is better than the other. The, the choices you make will eventually get you to where you go. It's just a different pathway. Okay. And I think a lot of times people look at things in black and white and it's all shades of gray. Totally. Yes. And this goes back to the whole church <laughs> uh, aspects uh, of like that's... religion and everything. It's like, I feel, oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and share what you're going to say. No, no, no. It's just like, it, it's true, the, you know, tapping into the religion because it's like, it's an indoctrination to control the masses, basically. Yes. But go ahead, Gina. That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, oh, my mom has a cup like that. <laughs> That's so cute. Yeah. They I love that. all the time. <laughs> I love that. Um, because it's a form of like, for us to be separated, where we're supposed to be united. And I feel that there's like, so many different, religions well, but yeah go ahead the, the other thing too gina to remember too it was a way to take your power away from you yes as well because your connectedness to your inner self is your essence your you know the spiritual aspect of who you are okay whereas the masses you know with religion and stuff they want you to not they, they want to pull you away from that so they could control you. And so they will tell you externally what is yes and no and what you have to do. So it's a real abuse of power on their part, but it's also a disempowering from our aspect. And, you know, we not only see this in religion, we also see this in healthcare as well. So, oh, yes. And we can talk a little bit about that. What are your experiences with that? Well, you know, being in healthcare for 45 years, I've been in the clinical setting. I'm still in the clinical setting, um, you know, along with, you know, being a TV, radio and podcast host myself and also um, being a speaker and um, working with, you know, clients um, from all over the world. I also am in the clinical setting as an assistant surgeon. That's where my gifts lay. Um, I have specialized training. I've been doing this for well over 30 years that I assist in surgery um, as an advanced practice um, nurse. And so instead of having two surgeons in your surgical operation, I'm the assistant surgeon. So I help the surgeon do the surgery basically. Wow. Um, and so I've witnessed a lot of things over the many decades that I've been doing this. I've assisted on close to 20,000 surgical procedures. And I get to see people's creation, their physical manifestation of a lot of things that they've created in their lives from uh, beliefs that they may hold about themselves, um, their, their thoughts, their emotions, whether or not they've experienced them or not, or their disconnectedness from themselves. Because when all of that, which is under the iceberg, the tip is the physical, is at um, imbalance or out of alignment, it tips over into the physical and you start getting physical manifestations of stuff. And an extreme case would be like witnessing somebody who has cancer. Mm. Okay. So, you know, and a lot of times what I found through my decades of doing this work, I used to question, why do they keep coming back? Mm -hmm. What's going on here? And it was very evident to me what was going on was we're really good at cutting out the bad part, doing the chemo and radiation, which is pretty much a Band-Aid technique, throw the Band-Aid on, and then a year and a half later, they're back. Right. Because what was driving that to create has never been healed and addressed. Right. Yes. It's like they don't get to the root cause of why exactly. this person is feeling this. Why are these cells um not good anymore and how yeah. do we create the regeneration of the cells i even hear there's like uh regeneration coaches out there now that are helping people with like the holistic aspects of everything and how to heal yourself 
Now, um, can you share a specific instance where you uniquely blend your skills profoundly that has profoundly impacted either a client or even a patient? Sure. Um, God, there's there's so many of them to to let me just let me just um, hone in a little bit just to to feel what would probably be appropriate. Sure. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to share this story because I I believe that people may understand this and it kind of, you know, we talk about energetic blocks and stuff like that. I had a, a client of mine several years ago who, believe it or not, was on the uh, list for a liver transplant because what had happened, he had developed hepatitis C and gone through all the therapies and stuff like that and still wasn't getting better. And the last resort thing was pretty much getting a donor, uh, a cadaver donor liver transplant. And so what was happening for him was that um, a liver would be made available and then the 11th hour, all of a sudden something would go awry and it wasn't happening. So this must have happened like four or five times. And so I finally um, worked with him and I kind of tapped into his energy. And what higher self was showing me was that there was a huge blockage in his heart that was, you know, like he was holding a grudge. It was like some act of unforgiveness. And what I found to be very profound, and it's a little different than what we know anatomy and physiology to be, because I get to see things from a, a different perspective and a different um, uh, dimension, so to say. Our organ systems are connected in ways you have no idea, okay? In traditional medicine, we put things in boxes like, you know, the the cardiovascular is in one box and the neurosurgery is in one box, but everything does talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think Western medicine needs to address and look at that a little differently. But anyway, back to our story here, between the liver and the heart, there's channels, there's channels between every organ system. It's like a matrix thing, but the channels were blocked going into the liver and coming out. And so I look back in the heart and I, 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 I really felt that there was something he was hanging on to that he needed to address. So I shared that information with him and he just welled up with tears and he knew exactly what that was. I mm. said, are you open to addressing this and doing some forgiveness work? Because I feel that this will help you, you know, in a real good way. And so he said he, he would. And so a week later, after he did this, his liver came. And it was the right match, the right situation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And the, the other thing that I also knew too, from working with this guy early on, you know, sometimes, you know, that is in his case, having the liver transplant was what he needed. And I'll tell you why, because there was a karmic debt that was owed to him from a previous lifetime from this person that he would never meet, but this was the gift that he was supposed to receive to pay off that debt. So you never know how things are going to orchestrate. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. Can we talk a little bit about what karma debt is and how that all plays out into our, our lives here on earth? Well, sure. Karmic debt is like something, you know, we, you know, for previous lifetimes, we've all had lifetimes where, you know, maybe we were the good person in that lifetime or the bad person, or we did somebody wrong in one lifetime and somehow we need to pay them back or we were mean to them or whatever, or we, we were even kind to them, but they never were kind back to us. And it's like, it's almost like to balance out the energy in the scales, okay, to make a wrong right. And sometimes, you know, we are born into a certain lifetime and energetically those other people are born to, it's a, it's a you know, a, a soul group, so to say, that we're all kind of incarnated together and we have all these different roles. Maybe, you know, in this lifetime, I'll be your mother and next lifetime, you'll be my brother and, you know, we'll be lovers and another, it's just like, it's just craziness. But it's very interesting because there's more going on than what we could put into words to describe. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just sense. so, so vast. So 
I hope that answered what I was sharing, you know, what, Oh yeah. It's just about balancing every, the energy It's just balancing yeah. everything. And so it's yeah. like the yin yang, the, the good yeah. and bad it has to balance yeah. itself. And, and everybody, and everybody's yeah. had different circumstances. I mean, we've all lived multiple, multiple, multiple lifetimes, not just here on earth, but in other places as well. So the thing is, is that, you know, we're always evolving and growing and it's all part of evolving and growing. Yes. And I agree with those multiple places because I actually come from somewhere else. Uh, we all do, Gina. <laughs> we all do, Gina. <laughs> yeah, right. Andromeda. And I've actually, uh, I've already ascended apparently. And I come from, so Andromeda, I think is like the Andromeda. And so I come from even up to the 12th, 12th dimension, but I wanted, I was supposed to come back here on earth to talk to talk about freedom or something because I'm well, no, I, I, this I is what know. happened Gina this is what happened for many of us who are here now that are you know doing the type of work that we're doing when we before we were born there was a clarion call out to the ethers saying earth is in trouble we need you know we need volunteers to come we all volunteered to come here yeah okay um and sometimes once you're here you're like Oh, hell no. I volunteered for <laughs> this. You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> totally. But the thing is, it's like, you know what? You did. Um, so it's utilizing, it's like stepping into the depths of your soul and who you are to pull out all your gifts in order to move forward. So the good news is, is that, you know, we are heading in the right direction. There's a lot of people who are doing amazing things, including yourself and myself, that are assisting humanity with this. Do we have a long way to go? Yes. And are we getting there? Yes. And is it going to happen overnight? Probably not, but we're on the right pathway. Okay. So the thing is, is not to give up hope, not to um, have a pity party or a temper tantrum which, you know, it's okay to do, but don't get stuck in it. Just keep moving forward, taking baby steps. You know, sometimes you need to sit and rest and it's okay. But it's about sharing what you know with other people to make a difference. Mm. That makes total sense. Yes. And I've had those pity parties for myself where I was like, I want to go home. <laughs> this is before <laughs> I knew anything. This is before yeah. I knew anything. <laughs> But I, my, my, my inner self, my, my, my higher self was telling me, yeah, you don't belong here. And I remember myself cried one day. I don't know what happened. I already forgot what happened, but I was like, I want to go home. I don't want I to know. be here on earth anymore. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, I, I'm going to share a really funny story yeah. because, you know, a lot of times when you've been on this path for a while, um, you just question a lot of stuff. And I just remember I really hit a bump in the road probably in, in 2010. And, you know, I felt like I kept asking for things and asking for things and that was silence. And so I finally raised my fist to, to the ceiling. And I said, if you're listening to me and you could hear me, just give me a sign. I said it just like that. And I kid you not out of the corner of my eye, the window in my backyard, something plopped from the sky onto the pavement. And I'm like, oh shit, what the hell is that? And so I go out there and there are no trees above where this happened. It just came out of the air. It wasn't a feather. It was a whole raven's wing. Oh my goodness. I know. So I'm, I'm like, I'm sheepishly going out there with a stick and poking at it. And I was just like, so I come back into the house and I could hear them laughing. I said, I was so humbled after that. I was, they're like, we hear you. It's just wow. not time. Yeah. So it, that, yeah, the Raven yeah. is an interesting thing because when I was a baby, my first memory, actually, I, I was in my crib. I felt like a slithering snake, like uh, underneath my diaper. And then like a Raven with red eyes was like right next to me. I don't know what that meant. I just that was oh, the wow. first memory that I had as a child um, or ever <laughs> as a oh as Gina God. here on earth. It was crazy. This was like, why? Are I <laughs> but I oh remember. So what's crazy is this. So I, I remember getting up on my crib 
crying, crying. I remember my sister, she's 10 years older than me. She was sleeping on a bed next to my crib. And then the door is in front of the crib. And I remember my mom coming, she had a red sweater coming down the hall and then picked me up. And that's all I remember. And so one day I asked her, I said, mom, did we live in a house where Letty slept in the same room as I did? And there is like, uh, in front of the door was my crib and there's a hallway. She's like, oh, She's like, yeah, that's the house in Milpitas. And that's where we used to live oh, wow. off Cherry Street or something like that. And I was like, so it was, must have been true. Because yeah, it she, was. Yeah, and it was crazy. But I've never seen anything after that. I've never seen any animals or any beings. So ever. are you familiar with animal totems at all? Mm -mm, not at all. Okay, so this is something. I invite you just to look up spiritual meaning of raven and spiritual meaning of that snake okay yeah and see what information you could get yeah because those are the two animals that I remember and I remember my mattress had circus animals all over it too yeah. it was yellow and that's all I remember the actual mattress that's very interesting that I remember that too um because so I know there's sheep on there do you remember were you scared or I think I was scared because I was crying okay, okay. yeah yeah all right Yes. Yeah, so well, that I, might have been that might have been your initiation. Perhaps, right? <laughs> perhaps, yes. But that's okay. But it, you know what? This is the other thing too to remember too. When nature is so we're so connected to nature, and you could become more and more connected to nature. Nature will talk to you. Um when you start working on yourself and it, I always tell people just spend time in nature because nature will commune with you. Um, pay attention to animals that cross your path. Okay. Like butterflies maybe, or dragonflies, or maybe a grasshopper and look up the spiritual meaning of that because they give you their messengers. This is more of a shamanic folklore type thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's about looking at your spirit totems because they will give you lots of information oh, wow. into another deeper aspect of yourself and give you guidance. So That's, it's very important. Yes. And I uh, wanted to bring up another thing. I remember recently I was, because I do massage therapy. And so I have a mm -hmm. client that I see weekly and we do the massage outside. He has a beautiful backyard, you know, and a lot of critters come out. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> I've seen bunny rabbits, there's ducks, there's even a dead rat in the in their pool once before. <laughs> but a uh, little lizards come out. And one time there was this big old flying insect that I couldn't even tell what it was, but it was like really like loud. And I'm like, what is that? It was it I a bet beetle? you it was a beetle. Yeah, I think it was a beetle, but I've never seen one that had these beautiful colors, like like yep. teal and yep. just it's a beetle. beautiful, beautiful they're actually, colors. They're actually very good luck. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good but look that know. up too. So, you know, whenever you're any place, mm -hmm. you know, just pay attention to what's going on, you know, because you're the birds, the animals will connect with you. Mm -hmm. And telepathically, we could communicate with them because they communicate telepathically. Mm -hmm. They don't, you know, it's like from heart to heart. It's just like, that's how the energy flows. There are animals, you know, I used to joke about this because, but it's the truth though. I believe that animals are highly evolved beings. Okay. They get it because they come from unconditional love and acceptance. They will, they will not think twice about nurturing another species. Mm -hmm or adopting another species to care for them to raise that young. That is true. Yes. But humanity, our humanness. Oh my God. It's, it's scary. It's very scary. When you see that in contrast, it's just like, you know, where the, the highly evolved species is and it's not us, unfortunately it's them. But yeah, I said you bring up a very good point. Absolutely. And uh, my cats, I remember a long time ago, it knew what I was thinking because it, <laughs> it would do exactly what I was telling do. it to do. I was yep. just telling, oh, I wish you would just not not play with that toy in my head, right? Not even out loud. I mean, plus, I don't even think they would understand what I'm saying anyway. It's the English language. <laughs> and then the and then my little kitty would just stop or they yep. know when I'm sad. That's why it's so good. During, yep. Even during my recovery after addiction, the, the animals are so good to have around because they, they are, understand you. Absolutely. And they just love you 
unconditionally. That's Thank the key you. right there. It's just their pure love. They're vibrating at a higher frequency than we are. When you vibrate at a higher frequency, no words are necessary. It's a feel thing. It's a connect. Yes. And it's like, you know, even though I saved them from the shelter, they actually have saved me more. So, <laughs> you know, going through what I went through and then them just being so comforting and loving. And even my son, who is um, on the cusp of autism, he mm -hmm. loves the animals and, you know, he gets to touch them and pet them and just love them so much. So they're, they're very therapeutic in many aspects. And so I, pre I love animals, any furry things. I just love Rept reptiles. I don't know. I don't really <laughs> like those. I'm, a, snakes. I, I'm not a big fan of snakes, but spiders are okay. I'm okay with rats, spiders or whatever, but snakes, no, thank you very much. I don't know. I must've had a real bad time, you know, another time and place, but um, yeah. yeah, no, I'm a big, I'm a big animal person. And I joke about this because um if I had to do it over again, I probably would have been a veterinarian. Oh, yeah. So because I just love how, you know, animals just get it. They just totally get it. And uh, your an animals always pick their owners out, too, just so you know yes. that. Yeah, especially the cats. So one cat I was fostering, and I know it wasn't the right one for me because he didn't like me that much. He he. He's like, all right, but he wound up going away. Literally, he's across the street right now to the other house that's kind of <laughs> empty with another cat family. Like he's neutered and everything, but there's two little kittens and a mom cat. I'm like, okay, well, at least I can see you and you're being fed because I see there's bowls and I would call him and call him, but he's happier there. I understand. Let that's him okay. be free. <laughs> be I know. Free. It's like, you can't hurt a cat. No, seriously, you just can't hurt a cat. It's just like, they're going to do their own thing. I had... I've had cats my entire life and I had one cat, God bless them. And they, they always, I'm, I'm convinced dogs look like their owners. Cats act like their owners. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's like they have aspects of your personality. And, you know, I had one cat, his name was Max and he was this Siamese cat with these blue blue eyes and he was a troublemaker he was the definition of in the moment <laughs> so the thing was it's like he taught me a lot about being spontaneous and in the moment and he was a feral cat that I adopted when he was six months old he actually got returned and they they said that I was the perfect person for them for him and I said okay well, I couldn't keep them in the house. And so I live in Southern California where we have a lot of coyotes running around mm -hmm. and um, their uh, cats are appetizers for those, those critters. And so I knew that he was probably going to have a very short lifespan with me, but I wanted him to be happy. Yeah. To me, his happiness was more important than keeping him caged up in the house and he's miserable all the time. I just couldn't handle that energetically. Um, so I let him like kind of, come and go as he pleased. And, you know, one time he just left and he never came back. So, you know, that's just the way it was. And they communicate with you telepathically all the time. So if I wanted him to come home, I would just in my heart to say, okay, Max, it's time to come home. And then he'd be around the corner coming in the house. So it's just like, he was very, you know, he, I really respect him and he respected me as well. But sometimes when it's time to go, it's time to go, you know? Yeah. And you can't, even though it's painful for us and we try to control it, it's just like, it's inevitable. And it was time for him to go on to his next adventure, whatever that was. Yes. And that's what I do with my little Benedict. I'm like, okay, you know, I just want you to be happy. No, that's <laughs> so it, you know, it's just like, and they feel, you know, anybody who says that animals don't have emotions or sensitivities has never had a pet. Right. I remember because I have little boys, right. And so, when my stepson, I remember he must have like fallen. He, we, he was upstairs in the bathroom upstairs and it was a big thunk. He was okay. But Benedict, I've never seen him like so like curious. <gasps> he crouched down like this and he was like, what's going on? And he went upstairs. He was like, just really checking up on little Isaac. Oh, yeah. They <laughs> love the children. Yeah. No, they're, they're protectors. They, they like doing their jobs that they're supposed to do. And, you know, and they, they high, they hold that to high regard, you know, right. that's, you know, the loyalty or being their protector or whatever. So, you know, our animal companions are, 
are definitely a gift, you know? Yes. And they feel like they, they help heal us as well. Especially like Absolutely. I said, with the addiction um, and recovery that, that oh, sure. my cats helped me tremendously. And they're just like, they're nonstop comforting me. I was like, they were just stuck on my bed the whole time. And I always Aww. appreciate them. They're so cute. Oh, I love awesome. them. <laughs> I know I can talk about cats and animals forever, but, but you know what? I, I want to circle, I want to circle back because I think I partially answered your question about people who come into, you know, the continuum thing. But yes, sometimes when it's in our family lineage, we get it as well. And, you know, I know for me, um, and I know I could speak for other people too, who are pretty intuitive and stuff. And speaking of cats, there's Gracie right there. Um, And so in my mom, my mom's side of the family, my grandmother was highly intuitive. And her, I just remember my grandmother being one of my first spiritual teachers, because as like a three and four year old, I used to, we used to talk about a lot of topics like heaven, what's heaven like, and, you know, and so she and I were really bonded and connected in that aspect, because I always thought my, my grandmother was very magical, that one in particular. And then I found out later on in my life that on my dad's side of the family, his grandmother was from Sicily and she was a healer apparently. And this is how they explained it to me. When people weren't feeling well, they used to go see her. And then after they left, they felt better. Mm -hmm. So she was doing healing work as well. So it is in the lineage. Sometimes it skips generations. Okay. I feel that, um, you know, it's just part of that. It's it's like you're getting it through your ancestral lineage, but also through your, um, you know, past lives as well. There's many tangents and aspects that it draws upon. So, you know. Yeah. So this way, some, some people said, oh, I feel like the black sheep of the family. Like sometimes oh. I feel like that too. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about the black sheep of the yes, family. Please. Okay. Because I think a lot of times, People like yourself and myself and maybe other people too are strategically put in our family clans to assist in healing the ancestral lineage that's been going on. Okay, so let's take that a step further. We are highly evolved. We're empaths, intuitives, and highly sensitive people. Your other family members may not be as much. You feel things at a very deep level. You're able to witness things through your lifetime, what you've gone through and pretty much put a stop to it. And so it doesn't go on further into the ancestral uh, collective consciousness, if you want to call it that. The beauty is, is that sometimes we don't realize that these are our gifts, but this is our mission until we're much older. And you could look back and see, there's no mistake here. There's no, you know, you're strategically put in these family clans to heal the ancestral stuff. And that's a big gift. That's a big responsibility. That's a big purpose. Um, And it's not for sissies. So you were, you signed up for this and you were, you took this on because they knew that you could do this. So the beauty of this as well, once you start working on healing ancestral stuff, Did you know that it heals up to seven generations in the past and seven in the future? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, it does. So it's big work. It's important work because we're getting to the point where where we're ascending um, and moving up in frequency from like third, fourth and going into the fifth dimension, okay, where there's more uh, love and, and, you know, it's not a... I, it's a we um, format, if you want to call it that, where we all come together for the greater good of everybody, not just an individual type of thing and ego driven. It's more of a, it's more of a we versus I. Um, When we get up to that fifth dimensional aspect, the ancestral stuff needs to be cleared. So that's why we are working on that and doing what we need to do now to purge that and to heal that and move that. And a lot of times it's just an awareness of what was going on is all that is needed to shift it. Mm -hmm. So it no longer happens. 
Okay. Wow. It's that simple. So a lot of times people think it's got to be all this complex thing in order for it to happen, or you're going to have to relive all this stuff. No, that's not true. Okay. Because when you're vibrating at a higher frequency, there's more light energy, there's more love, there's more light. What happens too is that there's bigger beacons and bigger lights being shown into the dark areas. So it's a lot easier to see that more so now today than ever before. Mm-hmm. That's what we're witnessing in the collective consciousness. Yeah. Okay. We have gone from, because this stuff has always been there. Right. It's just that we're vibrating at a higher frequency where we're above it and we could see down now is what the problem is. Okay. So that's how, once you see it, it's like bringing something from unconsciousness to consciousness. Once it's in your consciousness, then you could do something about it. So shining a beacon of light onto those dark areas is like bringing it from unconsciousness to consciousness because it wasn't being able to be seen, but now it's being seen. Now you can move forward and do something with it. So the illusion is, is that there's a lot of chaos and drama going on and that we're going to go, you know, things are, are falling apart. That's an illusion. They're actually being brought into the light so things could be done with it so we can move forward. Mm-hmm. Okay, That makes so, so much more we, sense. Yeah, because look at it. I mean, for the longest time, you know, things had been there and, you know, and nothing was done. I mean, going back to my childhood in the 60s, the white picket fences and all the perfect people on the outside and you get inside the house and it was like horrid, mm-hmm. horridville like all the emotional trauma and all the abuse and physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. It's just like people hid behind and, you know, don't tell anybody what's going on. What will the neighbors think? Well, they really could care less, you know, but but the point is, is (laughs) that's what we were. That's how, you know, my generation was programmed because I'm a little older than you, but it's just like unraveling all of that as well because that's all part of ancestral stuff that gets carried down, gets carried down, you know? Yeah. Same, same with my family uh, household. It was like, well, my mom would be like, well, what do you, aren't you concerned what he's going to think about you? Or this, this is like, should I be concerned? I don't really care to be honest with you. He probably doesn't either. He probably, (laughs) you know, it's like they make up these stories. It's kind of funny. And it's just like, they really don't. So yeah, I, I, it's just amazing how much we were conditioned and through like TV and through the oh fake God. news. Sometimes. Yeah, just turn it all off. Oh. I'm not kidding. It's just like, it's, I just have to, you know, add one thing considering, you know, the whole news thing. Um, where are you located? So I'm in the Bay Area. I'm in San Jose. Okay, so you're on the, you're on the West Coast too. Okay, mm-hmm. so anyway, remember like in August, they were talking about the hurricane that was going to come up the coast? Oh yeah, that's right. Okay, so I mean, there was so much sensationalization with that of how the doom and gloom and all this other stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm watching this on, you know, I was at, you know, my joy of being, my job. Um, and I was just like, this is creating crazy. They'd have no, it hasn't even happened. And they're showing pictures of this disease. I'm like, okay, so this is how they sensationalize things. And the same people that hoarded the toilet paper during COVID are going to go out and start hoarding toilet paper. Now I could just see it. And so, but it was interesting because I know for after living on the East coast for the first 30 years of my life that I've been through numerous hurricanes, And usually what happens is like once it hits land, it dissipates to a tropical storm Mm -hmm. unless it bounces back out into the ocean and then picks up momentum and it picks up momentum because it's a warm water Mm -hmm. and that you need warm water to um, increase the momentum. So the storm rejuvenates itself and carries on. So first of all, I knew that also we have cold water here. Pacific Ocean is freezing cold. It is. So once it hits landfall, and even if it bounced back, it's still going to dissipate because they don't have the the warmth of the warm water is not going to help it accelerate. Mm. So, you know what, all that really happened, it rained, you know, cats and dogs for about a day or so. We got a lot of rain. 
there was maybe some flooding, but there was nothing compared to what they were sensationalizing this about. I know. You know, it's just like they just create drama out of nothing. So I was just like, all right, thank you for showing me this off. Off. It's just like, because they make, <laughs> they make no sense at all. It's just like they're, you know. They want to just have have us be fearful. Because yeah. when we're fearful, then we cannot tap into our, our true nature, which right. is love. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And plus, you know what? If enough people, if there is a, a storm coming or whatever, people with coming together energetically and meditating on it and it can change can change the trajectory of a lot of different things. People aren't aware of that. Yeah. But you know, when you focus on something different, you create something different as well. Right. Yeah. Oh, I can talk to you forever. Maybe I have you come back on for like round two. <laughs> I would love that, Gina. That would be so cool. And you know, I know. Just... We, we didn't get to your book. We didn't even get to your. Well, the, the one thing I the one thing I do want to share with people, and I think it's really important too. If you yes, like the conversation do. that we had here, I talk about different things on. I have um, a TV, radio, and podcast show called the Dr. Dolores show and it's on inspired choices network out of Canada and it's beautiful because it broadcasts to over 450 different platforms universally and I'd be happy to give you that link so you could post it so people could check that out um, but we talk about everything from you know the invisible to the visible you know anything spiritual combined with physical and boundaries and forgiveness and becoming your own best friend and all that other stuff and spiritual sovereignty you name it we talk about it no it, there's nothing off limits <laughs> i love that that's great and so you'll send me the link and i will have that in the uh, show note yeah anywhere else that our listeners can follow you or find you yes coming? um they could go to uh, my website it's Dr. Dolores, D-O-L-O-R-E-S, Fazino, F as in Frank, A double Z as in zebra, I-N-O dot com. And there is a guided meditation to be in the present moment because I find that so many people are in their head a lot. They're either in the past, living in the past or living in the future. They're in fear, they're in stress. And when you're in your head, you are not in the present moment. You have to be in your body to be in the present moment. So it's a short, you know, seven, uh, seven minute guided meditation to get you grounded into your physical body. And um, especially if you have mind chatter and you have it, you're having a lot of uh, stress in your life and don't know what to do next. This is a very good first next step. Wow. I'm going to check that out because I love being in the present moment. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> all the time because just, I used to have I'm that just, chatter <laughs> I'm just laughing at my cat right now because she's just so I know so <laughs> like a beautiful statue I know it's just like she's the sphinx <laughs> I swear you know it's so funny because I ha I host another podcast co-host po another podcast and um the other co-host her name is Francine love her she has her cats every time we're talking the cat is like both cats are like right there next to her side by side. They love the energy. It's just they like love the energy. Yeah. That's right. They need to see this is proof. They know. They know. They know. <laughs> they know. And it's just like, yep, she's she's my baby. Aww. She's my boo. So cute. And All right. Like, Was there any last thoughts or anything else you would no, like? No, just you know, just you know, to remind everybody that just be kind to yourself and do your best to just take one step at a time. If you're feeling overwhelmed and tired, just rest. You know what? Just, just sit down and rest and breathe because we're all going to get through this. And you know what? Just consider this an adventure. Because when you look at it from that perspective, it's just like you will find the good in every situation. Yes, we are the authors, we are the producers, directors, and the main character of this story. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much, Dolores. It's a pleasure uh, uh, meeting you.
Right. 